Okay, um, you, you may have looked at the page numbers and realized <laughs> that we are a bit behind. And so we are, we are going to be booking it um, the rest of the evening. But it's designed that way to keep you awake. Like that is, it's, it's part of the goal. So here we go. The church teaches. All right, we've talked about two things so far the church, church does. See if you can remember them. The church evangelizes and the church baptizes. Now the church teaches. They devoted themselves, this is verse 42 of Acts chapter 2, to the apostles' teaching. If Jesus Christ is the head of the church and hence the source and goal of its entire life, true growth is only possible in obedience to him. Conversely, if the church becomes detached from Jesus Christ and his word, it cannot grow, however active and successful it may be. I was going to say, now there is a trend today in our day to minimize the teaching of the word, to say it's not that important, teaching of the word, like it's optional, just to have conversations or just do arts. Or I, I, was in a, I was in a seminar one time, this is when I was in seminary, and I should have said something, but I didn't. I mean, it would have been a bit arrogant for me to say something, though. Th- this guy was giving a presentation on how teaching and preaching in the church were of old and no longer necessary, and no longer important, and he gives this whole spiel about how music has re- replaced teaching, and so it's, it's music and, and other things, and, and so I, I wanted to raise my hand at the end of this hour talk and ask him if that was true, then why did he not sing his lecture? <laughs> so, anyway, and I was thinking, it was that battle, do I say something? No, I'm just a student, don't say anything, so... But this is, this is something the church is devoted to, has been devoted to for 2,000 years. I don't think we've quite reached the zenith in history that this man was surmising. Like all throughout Scripture and history we see power of the spoken word. And yes, technology affects a lot of these things, but the church teaches. Because the church is a community formed by God's word or saved by the word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing through the word of Christ. I should say we're saved by Christ through his word. That's how we're saved. We don't make up our own path to salvation. Scripture says this is how to be saved. Not just saved, we're sanctified through the word. This is the, this, the Bible is the book that is given to us. And as it's taught, we grow into the image of Christ. We're, we're reproved and corrected and we're training in righteousness. And we're servants of the word. We preach the word, Paul says. That's central in the church. That's a command in the church, an imperative. Preach and teach the word. So the church is a community formed by God's word, and the church is a community focused on God's word. Why? Why is this book so important in the church? Because the church reveres the magnitude of God's word. The church knows the significance of God's revelation. God reveals himself as the word. In the beginning was the word. Not in the beginning was the song, or in the beginning was the drama, or in the beginning was the music. In the beginning was the word. This is revelation. Jesus is God's communication to the world, his word. In, in 1 Samuel 3, there was, it was the days of Samuel, there was no frequent vision of the Lord. God raises up a prophet, and it says the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word. So God reveals himself as the word, and then God reveals himself through the word. What we see of the greatness of God, it's coming about because of his word all throughout scripture. Creation, formed by his word. Storm, still by his word. He speaks, and the waves obey. Fevers are cool. Demons are cast out by his word. Sins forgiven. The blind are made to see. The dead are raised to life by his word. The entire universe responds to the word of God. Think about it. God says, whom will you compare me to? Lift up your eyes and see who created all of these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, talking about the stars, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. The stars and the sky come out every night by the word of God. All right, think about that. There's 100 billion. (laughs) 
That is that that'll always make you pause. <laughs> Whenever you are claiming to speak on behalf of God and there is a loud boom over you. <laughs> I just want you to know how frightening that can be. <laughs> so, anyway, um, in our in our galaxy, there's a what a hundred billion stars. In our galaxy is one of millions of galaxies filled with hundreds and billions and billions and billions of other stars. When we, our God, brings them out one by one, and he calls them by name. Bob and <laughs> Mary and z one four five three six nine or I don't know what their names are, but our God does. And when he speaks, they, they shine. And this is, this is one of the humbling, most humbling quotes for me. I read this a long time ago. Charles Misner, scientific specialist in relative theory. Misner had, uh, Misner had, had studied Einstein. And this is his commentary on Einstein. The design of the universe is very magnificent and shouldn't be taken for granted. In fact, I believe that is why Einstein had so little use for organized religions, although he strikes me as a basically very religious man. He must have looked at what the preachers said about God and felt that they were blaspheming. He had seen much more majesty than they had ever imagined, and they were just not talking about the real thing. My guess is that he simply felt the religions he'd run across did not have proper respect for the author of the universe. The last thing I want to be said about me in the teaching of this word is that he was not talking about the real thing. And this is, this is why this word is important in the church. Because, because this word, the magnitude of this word, of what God has said, cannot be overestimated. The church knows the seriousness of man's proclamation. Even when we saw in Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. The language there is to speak with seriousness and gravity. And you think about it. Oh, look at 2 Corinthians 4. This is an amazing three verses together. Verse 4. The God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. Verse 6. God said, light shine out of darkness. And he's shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. So you got... The God of this world blinding minds in verse 4. And the true God shining light in the hearts in verse 6. And in the middle, what does it say? We proclaim not ourselves, but Christ, Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. Like, I hear people talk today about, we just need to have casual conversations in the church. You don't need to, to teach. And, and obviously we see how light teaching supposedly has become in the church. And filled with entertainment and jokes and all these, like, do we realize there is a true God over this world who is shining light into hearts. And there is a false God, little g, God of this world, Satan. And the true God desires every person to enjoy everlasting joy in heaven and the God of this world wants every single person to burn in hell. And in the middle, we preach Christ. Like, they don't leave room for casual, just talk. Like, no, this is serious here. This is, lives are dependent on hearing the word of God. That's why the preacher or teacher exposes the voice of God. And we have this tendency to minimize in the church what God has said, and we maximize what we say. And we have all kinds of thoughts and opinions, and no, like we need this. 
We, we do it. What's dangerous is we, we cloak it with the word. We take, like, for example, like take Nehemiah, for example. <laughs> Nehemiah has been just classically abused as, well, this, this is God's textbook on leadership in the church. And so we'll use this, and we'll just talk about all kinds of leadership principles. And basically, we take, like, leadership books, and we take the principles there, and we try to find them in Nehemiah. And the problem is, when you get to Nehemiah chapter 13, verse 23, okay, this is God's textbook on leadership. Nehemiah says, in those days, I saw the Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half their children spoke the language of Ashdod. They could not speak the language of Judah, but only the language of each people. So I confronted them, Nehemiah said, and cursed them, and beat some of them, and pulled out their hair. <laughs> leadership principle number 13. <laughs> You get mad, you confront people. You beat them. And then you pull the hair out of their heads. Like you're not pushing books by selling that leadership principle. But this is the deal. And you say, well, of course we would not say, well, then that's a leadership principle. Well, here's the danger. Now we're choosing which ones we like and which we don't like. And we're maximizing what we want to say. We're minimizing what God has said. Like this is the key. We expose the voice of God. And in the process, we exalt the greatness of God. When the word of God is spoken, then the greatness of God is revealed. This is why I hate it when I'm preaching somewhere and somebody says, kind of introducing things and says, after a time of worship, then David's going to come up and speak. No. Like what am I going to do? Well, you were worshiping, so now I'm just going to talk. No, like I'm going to speak. And, and the job of a teacher in the church is to speak in a way that people are gripped by the glory of God because his word is being revealed. And when God's word is revealed, we see its greatness and we worship. That's the whole design. Not turn off the worship meter when the song ends. No, turn it up when the word is proclaimed. So... Anyway, I, I, this, we're never going to get through this. Um, some people say, well, you're kind of over-exalting the word, almost like it's too important. Look at Psalm 56.4. You've got to skip down a little bit. In God, whose word I praise. It says it again in verse 10. I will lift up my hands toward your commandments, Psalm 119. I will bow down. Verse th Psalm 138, toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for, you have st for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. His word put on the same plane as his name, exalted. And so I want, I want us to, this, this is a book that we, we do, we revere it. And, and we must teach it. If we don't teach it, then we're, we're, not, we're not doing what the church is supposed to do. The church respects the authority of God's word. Apart from the word, the preacher's helpless. What, 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 do we, what do we say? Are we just, do we really think we have in our minds and our thoughts what people need to call them to obedience to? No, only the word has that. Like this is, and this is so, I, I remember, it's one of the most poignant moments in my own life was sitting in a worship service, and I was sitting down near the front, and the guy who was speaking had a, uh, Real charismatic personality and uh, very entertaining. And he got out, the first words out of his mouth, he said, I forgot my Bible tonight. And I thought, problem number one. Because I got mine. So, so he, starts, he starts talking. He starts talking about how he would prayed about what to say to us that night. And he said, I did all the things I, I do. I, I went and, uh, and got mocha at Starbucks, and I went and did this or that, and, and took walks, and I'm just trying to think through what, what does God want to say. And I did all these things, and I, I just, nothing ever came to me. And he was telling jokes, kind of funny, and he got to the end, and he said, so maybe that means God just doesn't have anything to say to us tonight. And, and, and so he, he finishes, and he sits down. And I'm sitting there thinking, bro, you got a, this book, which it had been helpful if you'd have brought. <laughs> but you got this book. In here, there are 66 different books that are the word of God. 
like skip the mocha, open it up, and you've got a word. And you don't have to find something, create something, go on a walk, turn to Leviticus for all I care, read it, and you got a word from the Lord. You don't have to make something up here. Like, this is the key. We don't have to make something. It's not upon me as a pastor to make up something to say to people. No. We teach the word, and apart from the word, we're helpless. Absolutely helpless. Like, I'm not the chef here, I'm the waiter. I don't, I, don't, I don't make the food. It's there. My job is just to get the food to the table. Get it there hot. That's, that's what we do. So <laughs> apart from the word, the preacher is helpless. And apart from the word, the church is powerless. What are we going to build the church on? Your innovations? No. So the church recognizes this, the relevance of God's word next how the word speaks to contemporary needs with eternal promises. That's the beauty. It's what Peter is doing. He, he quotes all over the place from the Old Testament in Acts chapter 2, and he's bringing it to bear on what's happening right here. And that's what we do. We take this word and we teach it, and we show, the teacher shows how it applies here. You see all these promises that I listed here. The Bible makes about itself promises of success and blessing and a guide, comfort, peace, wisdom, salvation, satisfaction. Like, why would we want to listen to anything else? Why would we want to listen to anything else? The church realizes the purpose of God's word. The purpose of God's word. Now, here's the purpose of God's word. Follow with me. This is huge. This is not just for teachers or preachers to understand. This is for everybody in the church. We need to know this. God's agenda in Scripture to tell us about the glory of Christ. This book points us to one person, and it's Christ. He's at the center of it. And so, so everything in the book points us to Christ. But that's, that's not all. Okay, yes, to tell us about the glory of Christ and to transform us into the image of Christ. Okay, follow with me here. Let me show you the purpose of the Bible. In the beginning, God creates, Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1, 26 and 27. He creates man in his image, in his likeness, right? In Genesis 3, sin enters the world. Third chapter in the book, the image of God is marred in man. And what you've got from there on, so from Genesis 3 on, is the story of how God is redeeming recreating man in his image. And then you get to the very end, Revelation chapter 21, new heaven and new earth. And well, look, look, look real quick at the end of, uh, end of Genesis chapter 3. When the Lord sent God, the man out of the garden, he drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden, he, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So he's left out from the tree of life. When you get to Revelation 22, listen to this. The angel of God showed me the river, the water of life, where I is crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb to the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of what? Life. Makes it come back here. With its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are now for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. But the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Some of the most beautiful words in Scripture, verse 4, they will see his face. That, that's where all of Scripture is headed toward. So think about it like bookends, okay? You've got man created in the image of God and marred image of God in man. At the end, you've got man recreated into the image of God, brought back to him. And the middle is the story of how God does this. That's the purpose. And you see it, I've listed scriptures all throughout here, how everything, I awaken your likeness, Romans 8, 28, everything's working for the good of those who love God and are called according to purpose. Well, what's the good? Those he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the whole point. Everything is headed toward that, that we might be like Christ. We might be remade into image of our creator. And so here's the deal. What that means is we need to be really careful. We've got to see this. The purpose of the Bible then, and this will sound a little bit heretical, I think, when you hear it, but go with me. The purpose of the Bible is not to answer every single question we have in the world. And this book doesn't answer every single question in the world. There are so many things this book doesn't specifically address. What does this book say about teenage years? 
I hardly any, not, nothing. It's a totally different picture there in this book. What does this book say about divorce recovery? You don't see, what does this book say about what to do with a 401k? Like, and yet, and yet, if we're not careful, what we say, what we do is we come to this book and we, we, we hear people asking questions about those kinds of things. We say, well, what can I do with this book to try to help answer their questions? But that's not the purpose. That's the, that, that, this is the focus in the church's worship. Two options, human tips or the divine text. Tips on financial victory and walking through divorce recovery and raising teenage children. I mean, you got to spare the rod, spoil the child, but beyond that, like, you got all kinds of tips, though, being offered all across the church today that are either the latest book from the Christian bookstore being taught instead of this, or, or this word being twisted to say something that it wasn't intended to, to say. And now, it's good motives. Again, it's pragmatism here. It's good motives. We want to help people walk these things. But follow this. When we focus on human, tip, human tips and instead of the divine text, what do we do? We end up robbing ourselves of the truth that is necessary for realizing God's purpose in our lives. And God's purpose is to conform us into the image of Christ, right? Think about it. What, is the, what, is, what do we need on a Sunday? You think, well, I'm walking through this situation in life. Why are you going to tell me about the Moabites? And that's, that's, the, that's the approach that so many wonder. Well, here's the deal. Don't miss it. This word about the Moabites here in the book of Ruth is promised by God through his spirit to conform your heart into the image of Christ and to help you know him and walk with him in step with his spirit. And sure, it may not speak directly to the, to the financial struggles you're walking through right now. But here's the deal. The, the, the beauty is when we focus on, on this word and the purpose that it's given to us for, then, then we walk away. And yeah, maybe we don't have an answers from the preacher or teacher about how I need to walk through this financial struggle, but we do have the very spirit of God inside of us that we know. And not is just, not just going to give us answers and tips. He's going to walk with us through these financial struggles. He's going to form our minds and our desires in the process. And he's going to make us look more like Christ. And that's going to be better regardless of how much money we have in the end. That's what we need. When we don't get that, we rob ourselves of what we need for realizing God's purpose in our lives. And we rob God of the glory that is due his name. We start looking at different communicators in the church because they've got all the answers. No. No. I'm not that good. I know that. I don't have all the answers on divorce recovery or how to, how to be a single mom or how to raise teenagers or how to manage your money. But, but I do have what is necessary, what is most helpful for bringing you into the image of Christ and getting you in touch with the one who will walk with you through whatever happens in your life. Many pastors can preach whole messages with little more than a tip of the hat to a clause or two taken from the biblical context that few, if any, recognize. Even more pastors have decided that using the Bible is a handicap for meeting the needs of the different generations. Therefore, they have gone to drawing their sermons from the plethora of recovery and pop psychology books that fill our Christian bookstores. The market forces demand that we give them what they want to hear if we wish them to return and pay for the mega sanctuaries that we have built. Here's the, here's the other option. When we focus on the divine text instead of human tips, we fill ourselves with the truth that is necessary for realizing God's purpose in our lives, and we glorify God by becoming like Christ. And that's what we want more than anything. We want to become like Christ. The Word feeds the character of Christ in us and instills the conscience of Christ in us. He changes our hearts and our minds and then character conscience and then the word produces the conduct of Christ in us. So we begin to live out our faith. And this is the beauty. All right, now follow with me here. When we get this word and it's changing our hearts from the inside out, we're beginning to love Christ more. We're beginning to think more and more like Christ. We begin to act like Christ. This is where life transformation happens. But if we just start with, well, people want to know what they need to do, and we tell them, all right, we'll do this. Here's some tips on this or this or this. Even good tips we give. Think about, think about teenagers struggling with purity, college students struggling with purity. Like we can say all day long, be pure. 
Now, do it. Be pure. Avoid sexual immorality. We can say that all day long, but until, until teenagers and college students are growing to love Christ and His Word, and He's changing their hearts, and He's changing the way they think and they feel and they desire, where teenagers and college students begin to see that Christ is far more satisfying than anything else in this world put together. It's not until that happens that they'll begin to live in purity. I mean, they may try for a few times to be pure, but it's going to fade away because we need Christ to do this in us, and he's got to be formed in us, and the Word does that. So many, so many high school students go off to college, and their faith is ripped apart within weeks. Why? Could it be that the character of Christ was never really formed in their heart and their minds for being to think Christianly so that some pagan professor can't just slash them down with one statement? We need this word. And church reveals the effect of God's word because when it's taught, when it's taught, the word elicits conviction. It cut to the heart in Acts 2. It's sharper than a double-edged sword in Hebrews 4. People begin to realize the gravity of their need and the greatness of God's provision. The word explains conversion. What I mean by that is it tells us how to be saved. You look in Acts 2, 37. The people heard this. They were cut to the heart, and they said, Brothers, what shall we do? Peter replied, Bow your heads, close your eyes, and pray a prayer to accept Jesus. No. He said, just saying, he said, he said, repent. Like, we, we would be wise in the church to use biblical terms to explain conversion. We would be wise to do that. We don't, we don't want to mislead people, particularly in the name of trying to get as many people as possible to respond. We, we don't want them to stand on sinking sand that will prove hollow in the end. You look all throughout Acts. You see these two words over and over again. Sometimes repent is the only word that's used. Other times faith or believe is used. And sometimes repentance and faith are both mentioned. Conversion. Repentance, we turn. Conversion, when we are saved, we turn from our sin and from ourselves and, and believe. We trust in Christ as the risen Savior and the reigning Lord. So we teach that in the church. The word establishes a craving. The beauty is, as the very next sentence we have, after they receive the word and are baptized, it says in verse 42, they devoted themselves to the teaching the Spirit of God through the Word. As we're led by the Spirit, we long for the Word. When people taste this Word, they'll see how good it is and they won't want anything else. Like, it's that good. We can trust this Word. It will create a longing and a craving in it so that when, when we get tried opinions from somebody else, we know, oh, that sounds good, but it, it's not this. So that's why the church teaches. The church evangelizes, baptizes, and teaches. Then, fourth, the church nurtures. They, nurtures. they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship. This is a great word. You might write it out to the side somewhere. I didn't put it in there. Were Ko koinonia. Well, I say that. K-O-I-N-O-N-I-A. I. -O -N -I, -A. I, <laughs> I don't know. You try it. Koinonia. Is, is the word we see all over the New Testament for the fellowship, for the, the church. And, and the picture is, this is what the church shares in common. That's really what the word is saying. So what do, what do members of the church have in common? What well, unites us? Well, first, obviously, a common spiritual foundation. You look, and I just put, I put some different instances, and in all these verses that are below there are instances of koinonia. We share in the body and the blood of Christ, 1 Corinthians 10. We share in the spirit of Christ. We share in the gospel of Christ. We share in the sufferings of Christ. We share in the life of Christ. So we share a common spiritual foundation and a common social interaction. Our lives are shared with each other. That's the beauty of this, this paragraph. This is not just anonymous church attendants sitting next to somebody. This is real sharing of life together possessions and struggles. What I, what I put down here, there are one another's all over the New Testament when it comes to the church. And so I, I put four categories here that we're going to unpack under nurture here. We care for one another, we serve alongside one another, we give to one another, and we restore one another. So we're going to go through each of those. We care for one another. This is what we do in the church. This is what it means to share life. 
We care for one another. Romans 12, I started there, is a great picture of community in the church. It starts with us receiving mercy from God. We have mercy from God. And as a result of that, we reflect mercy toward one another. And so it starts by the mercies of God, Romans 12, and then the rest of the chapter, if we're talking about worship before God, then it talks about community with one another in just beautiful ways. And we see here and all over Scripture, just, I've, I've just put a litany of love one, uh, of one another's here. How do we care for one another? Obviously, we love one another. It's what Romans 12, verse 9 says, let your love be genuine. The word there, not a common term for Paul to use uh, in that culture, but agape love, this term for unselfish, self-giving love. And then he gets down later and he says, love one another with brotherly affection. Fellow storge, basically a, a brotherly friend brother kind of love, and, and so we see this picture, I mean, family affections that are in the church. We love one another. We host one another, show hospitality to one another. We greet one another. Uh, I guess you could put kiss in that blank if you would like, and it would be biblical based on 1 Corinthians sixteen twenty. Greet one another with a holy kiss, um, but I would stay with greet. We greet one another. We receive one another. We Honor one another. Outdo one another in showing honor, Romans 12.10 says. What a great phrase. Outdo one another. We serve one another through love. Serve one another, Galatians 5 says. We instruct one another, Romans 15. We wait for one another. We're patient with each other. We forgive one another. We submit to one another. We already talked about it, Hebrews 10. We spur on one another. We build peace with one another. Be at peace among yourself. I love Galatians 6. We bear one another's burdens. We bear one another's burdens. We encourage one another. Build one another up, it says. And then we comfort one another. So after we encourage one another, we comfort one another. And this is 2 Corinthians 1. It's a, it's a beautiful picture. You can go through even in that passage. You circle every time you see comfort. I think it's ten times in that one paragraph alone. Second Corinthians chapter 1. Talking about how we comfort each other. And how suffering happens in our lives. God uses suffering for our sake. To draw us to Him. To help us depend on Him. But not just for our sake. God uses suffering for others' sake. So that when we receive the comfort of God in suffering, we extend that comfort to others. It's this whole picture. You get to 2 Corinthians 7. God who comforts the downcast comforted us by the coming of Titus. Not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted by you. It's this whole circle of comfort. Like, I read that verse. I expect Michael W. Smith to chime in with friends or friends forever in the background. It's just this, <laughs> you get these chills. That won't translate either. X that out. Um, but it's this picture of how God uses our suffering to help us learn to depend on him, and then to extend comfort to others, and then ultimately God uses our suffering for his sake so that we might trust in his strength when we are weak. We pray for and confess to one another, James chapter 5. We esteem one another. We edify one another, mutual upbuilding. We teach one another, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. We are kind to one another. You, you read those, and that's not all of them. You get the point. Like, it's just all over the place. Like, church is so much more than sitting next to someone in a service. This involves real investment of life. It takes time to do those things. It takes energy and emotion and vulnerability. So when I, when I say, are you committed to a local church, are you doing that in a local church somewhere with a group of people? Why is this so important? The gladness of the family reflects the glory of the Father. When we love each other in the power of the gospel like this, God gets great, great glory. So we care for one another in the church. It's a part of nurturing. And then we serve alongside one another. This is the other part of Romans 12, is we see Paul talking about how, how we have different gifts in the body. Now follow this. This is, this is such a beautiful picture. Romans 12, 3 through 8 teaches that we are a family designed by grace. God has given us grace. 
each one of us grace. All of us have been given grace. Any good thing in any one of us is evidence of his grace toward us. So we're designed by grace and then diversified by gifts. So when we see spiritual gifts talked about, this is what Scripture teaches that gifts, spiritual gifts, are grace gifts. They're given to us by God. And every person in the church has them. This is the beauty. The church is a family of faith where everyone counts. Like every part, the whole body imagery in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 is intended to show us every part of the body matters. The I can't do it without the foot, without the hand. That's what Paul's saying, and that's, that's the key. Everyone counts here. No one is inferior. In the church, we must guard against self-depreciation. This idea, well, they, you don't need me. They don't need me. Yes. A local church needs you. And we also guard against superiority. We guard against self-exaltation. Well, I don't need you. You need a local church. You need the gifts that are in a local church. So it's not optional. We need it. And they need it from us. No one inferior, no one superior. No need to compare. We have to be careful not to compare ourselves. Well, I'm not as gifted as that person or this person. No, no. It's all by grace anyway. It's all by grace. So, so take the grace in you. Rest in the grace in you. Don't compare. No need to copy Try to imitate somebody else and what they have. No, how has God wired you? Everybody counts in this thing. And God has gifted you with gifts that this person doesn't have, that you're comparing yourself to. Like, they need the gifts that you have in their lives. So everyone counts and everyone contributes. Every, where everyone contributes. Where everybody uses their gifts to the glory of God. So this is, this is how we nurture one another. By caring for each other, by serving alongside each other with the grace gifts we've been given. Third, we give to one another. And God set this up way back in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy 15, among his people. And then we basically see that picture of Deuteronomy 15 coming alive in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4. And, and then in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, and we, I'm going to fly through this because we talked about this at the last secret church, the gospel possessions and, and prosperity. But but the picture in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 in particular where, where we are. So we see modeled in Acts 2 and 4. I mean, this sharing of possessions with each other. Selling homes and lands to give to each other. So we see that modeled. And then you get to 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. And you really see it encouraged and exhorted. Even commanded in some senses. We give willingly. So this is not, not begrudging giving in the church. We give based on God's blessing to us. The whole picture in 2 Corinthians 8 is, is churches in Macedonia that are poor, that give, that gave this extravagant offering. Like it's, it's, it's always humbling. Uh, it's happened in house churches in Asia. It happened uh, a couple of weeks ago in Southeast Asia to have the privilege of teaching the word in a house church or this, this church that I was in in Southeast Asia. And, uh, and then afterwards they come up and they say, we, we want to give you this, this gift. It's monetary. I mean, these... Folks are, well, in some context, extremely impoverished. And they say, we want to give. And it's not begrudging. And, and of course, find, find ways to use that to give back to that church. And don't take that in that sense. But it's the beauty. It's what, exactly what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 8. We give at least according to our ability. That's the picture of the widow's might in Mark 12. And what, what Paul's talking about in 2 Corinthians 8, the New Testament reality is give all that you can. Give all that you can. And according to different measures of grace we have, so give. We give willingly, we give generously. Generous giving to God results in greater giving from God. Now I want to be careful there. I'm not saying that if you give to God, you'll get rich. The Macedonians pretty much debunk that. God's not promising He's going to make you wealthy. But the whole picture in 2 Corinthians 8, you go back and read it, and he's saying God entrusts, entrusts gifts to, for his purposes to be accomplished. God gives enough for us, and he gives abundance for others. And I, I, we talked about this, and uh, 
John Wesley is an example of this, putting a, a cap on his life. Charles Edward White uh, is the person who was writing the biographer here. But talking about how he put a cap on his life to say, I want to give as much as I can away. And so basically kind of put a cap on his life as the equivalent of about a $20,000 salary. And at points he was making $160,000, but he still lived here and he gave away $140,000. Like this is a picture. And there's no legalistic measures here, but the picture is we give, we give willingly and generously and we give cheerfully. The, the word in 2 Corinthians 9, the God loves a cheerful giver. The word is like, God loves a hilarious giver, like, write the check. Ah, ah, yes. That's, that's God's design. We're not forced by God to give. We're freed by God to give. In the church, we give as a demonstration of the gospel. 2 Corinthians 8 9 is the key verse there. We sacrifice our rights for others and spend our resources on others. And in the end, we give to promote thanksgiving to God. Giving, this is so key. Giving unites the people of God. I want you to look at Romans 15 real quick. I know we've been flying, but, but look at this real quick with me. Macedonia and Achaia have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. They were pleased to do it. I want you to circle that word contribution right there. That's koinonia, translated contribution here. But it's the picture of fellowship in the New Testament. What I love about that verse, it's just a real simple verse at the end of Romans. But what it shows us is these churches in Macedonia and Achaia poor churches, impoverished churches, were giving for an offering for the church at Jerusalem. And in their doing that, this is a picture of community. This was the church in Macedonia and Achaia saying to the church in Jerusalem, we're with you. And we're together. And this is what this is where we we have a, a dangerous tendency in our churches here by spending our money on more and more and more stuff for ourselves and by sending so little to brothers and sisters who are literally starving. By our not giving to them, it's, it's like we're saying we're not with you. And, and I want to I encourage those who are part of this church and, and many other churches, let, let's, let's show our brothers and sisters around the world, Koinonia. Let's show them that we're with them and that we, we care for them by giving to them. It unites us together, it unites the people of God. We give regularly to the church. You see that? First Corinthians 16 on the first day of every week, put something aside, store it up as we prosper. And then the church deals responsibly with our gifts. I love how Paul in 2 Corinthians 8 was really, really intentional to show how. how the gifts that were given were definitely being used for what they had been said they would be used for. Giving exalts the goodness of God. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift is the way it all ends there in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. Okay, so how do we nurture? We, we care for one another. We serve alongside one another and we give to one another. Fourth thing, we restore one another. And this is where I want to talk about uh, church discipline. Now let's put it down on the table, just get it out there. Not the most happy topic in most people's minds, or the most common topic in a lot of churches, and I, I think to our detriment. We have ignored this picture of restoring. Galatians 6, 1 through 5, talks about bearing one another's burden, burdens, and it says, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And people say, well, there's all kinds of reasons why not church discipline, and and there's a bunch of reasons here. Let, uh, just, just think about the reasons, and I'll come back with some responses to them. So we'll kind of skip around in your notes a little bit. But some people say church discipline is legalistic, contradictions, contradicts God's grace and his love. And clearly, you start talking about church discipline, you're probably going to get charged with some kind of legalism. And the question is, what? well, we'll see. What about Matthew chapter 7, verse 1? Judge not that you be not judged. So that's, that's always thrown out there. Don't judge. John 8, 7 is another one. He who is without sin, let him cast the first stone. So if you, don't, if you don't have sin, then you can talk about somebody else's sin. Well, that pretty much covers it. Nobody can talk about anybody else's sin at that point. Well, we'll get to that. People will leave the church, they say. Let me tell you what's not at the top of the charts of the church growth magazines. Like you put out on the banner, like we're a church that disciplines sinners. You're not drawing a crowd that way. Uh, 
We're the church that cares, the loves, that nurtures. We're the church that disciplines. So anyway, people are going to leave the church. I was talking with one pastor when we were walking through some of this at Brook Hills, talking about church discipline, and I said, man, I'm, we're about to dive into this. And he said, well, give me a call if you're still there and tell me how it goes. And so anyway, <laughs> thanks, bro. People will leave the church. The church doesn't know how to practice discipline. So, and, I, and I've been told, well, it just doesn't work in our churches in our context today. Well, let's think about that. Church discipline is legalistic. No, church discipline is loving. We think it's noble, even compassionate, to sit back and say, well, what somebody else does is between them and the Lord. It's not my business. That is anything but loving. Like if I am walking off the deep end towards sin and you love me, say something to me. Don't just sit back and think this is my business over here. No, I need you as my brother in Christ to pull me back. That's, that's how you love me. That's how God loves us. He disciplines those whom he loves. So, so we need to love one another. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, I should have put this quote in there, nothing is so cruel as the tenderness that consigns another to his sin. God, help us to love one another. That's what church discipline is. What about Matthew 7, 1? Well, keep going to Matthew 7, 5. He says, Talking about the log in your own eye. Well, take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So what he's saying is, take the speck out of your... He's not saying, don't worry about your brother. He's saying, get yourself clean, and then help him out too. Like, yes, do it. People will leave the church. Well, here's the deal. This is God's church to grow, not ours. I mean, there are easier ways to grow a church than talk about church discipline. But, I mean, you remember Acts chapter 5? Ananias and Sapphira trying to give an offering and they deceive and they're struck down dead. I mean, how do you grow a church? Have, have God kill a few people at the offering. That'll do it. <laughs> well, no, okay, this is, this is tough stuff. But don't look at the end of this passage. Verse 13, none of the rest dare join them, but the people held them in high esteem and more than ever believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. God knows how to grow his church. We can trust him on this one. This is what God does. Yeah, okay. Church doesn't know how to practice church discipline. Well, then the church needs to learn how to practice church discipline. What, what does this really look like in the church? So what is church discipline? And what I want us to see, this is not talking about some witch hunt or some investigation of rumors. Here, here, think about it this way. Two facets of church discipline. One, formative church discipline. Continual training that believers receive from the word in the body of Christ as their lives are transformed into Christ-likeness. We're being disciplined every day, right? The spirit of God and the word of God is disciplining us. He's training us to follow after Christ. This is happening all the time. This is what sanctification is about, growing in discipline. But then, restorative church discipline. And this is corrective care taken by the body of Christ in matters of unrepentant sin in a brother or sister's life. So when we're caught in sin, Galatians 6, 1 says, and as we're about to see in Matthew chapter 18, when, when there's sin in a brother's life that is unrepentant, that he's, that he's continuing in, what I want us to see is there's one foundation for church discipline, and it's the grace of God. <coughs> God disciplines us by grace. And Titus 2, 11 talks about how Grace disciplines us in godliness. So the challenge for the church is to make sure grace is at the middle of discipline. So how do we bring those two together? Well, Jesus helps us. Approaching church discipline. In just a second, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 18, 15 through 20, and the main instruction that Jesus gives on church discipline. What I want you to see, though, is what surrounds this contextually. He's talking in Matthew 18, 4. We need childlike humility. He starts talking about humbling yourself like a child. And then he talks about not leading others into sin. In Matthew 18, 6, we need a deep concern for holiness. We, we want to be concerned about holiness in the body of Christ. Humility, holiness, we need compassion for the hurting. He talks in Matthew 18, 14, this is not the will, it's not, it's not the will of my Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. God has designed church discipline for the church 
to, to guard and to care for every single person in the church. That's the whole purpose. And then we need forgiving hearts. Matthew 18, right after he talks about church discipline in verse 21 and 22, he talks about forgiving your brother. And there's a way this can work. I, I got a letter from a member of this faith family here who said, Dear Pastor, two weeks ago on a Sunday morning, my wife came to you with a dire request for prayer. It was indeed dire, for I was on the verge of making a huge mistake that would have haunted me for the rest of my life. I was in the process of leaving my family in search of who knows what. Something better, something straight out of Satan's playbook. I was on the edge of a cliff with one foot over. My wife and everyone she knew were praying that I would come back. And because of their prayers and their subsequent work, the Lord did not leave me to do what I thought I wanted to do. But he poured his grace on me and my family, and we are once again whole. That needs to happen all over the church. But that is not easy. So how do we do this? Matthew 18, Jesus gives the instructions. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Now this is one of the only times Jesus uses the word church and it really addresses the church like this in all the Gospels. This is important. And basically there's four steps here. One, private correction. Brother caught in sin, Galatians 6 says, go to him. Matthew 18, go to him. Don't go talk to others about it. Ephesians 4, 29 through 32. Don't, don't talk about your brother in a way that doesn't build up his character. Gossip kills proper church discipline. So go and talk to him, just between the two of you. That's huge. Don't leave him to wander off the cliff. Like, go to him. Childlike humility, concern for holiness, grace, and love. Step two, if he still is, he or she still unrepented, continuing in sin. They repent, okay, it's, it's great. Yes, you've won a brother, yes. They continue in sin. Step two, small group clarification. So take a couple of others along. That's where Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy chapter 19. So find others who are gentle and humble and loving. The goal is not to gang up on this person. The goal is to bring a couple of other people along who love and care and have the spirit of Christ and the grace of Christ in them to encourage, to say, we love you. We want you to turn from sin. I want you to see the destructive nature of where you are going. So bring them back. If that does not work, if they continue in sin, step three, church admonition. Tell it to the church. Why? Why tell it to the whole gathering? And, and that can seem in some senses cruel to some people. I mean, now all these people know this guy's going off in this direction. The, the point is, so that now you've got a whole body of believers running after that believer saying we love you and we care for you and we want to pull you back to Christ. We want to help you see. This is God setting up a way for his entire body, his people to say, go get them and love them and bring them back. It's grace, it's mercy, it's love. Church admonition. And then step four, if Continues treat him like a Gentile tax collector, tax collector, pagan or tax collector. Church excommunication. Church excommunication. So he's no longer treated as a member of the body of Christ. Now, oh, that seems so tough, doesn't it? Like for the church to basically kick someone out, so to speak. I thought the church was supposed to be the place where everybody is always welcomed. Now you're saying you can't be a part of this group anymore? Is that loving? Is that caring? Is that gracious? Yes. And it's godly. Hear what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5 when he confronts this issue. We'll read this passage. Let's get through this and we'll take a, take a break. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even tolerated among pagans for a man has his father's wife. Sexual immorality, a man 
his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you rather not to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in body, Paul says, I am present in spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present, with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are deliver- to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know the little leaven leavens the whole lump, cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. Like, if you're going to not associate with sexually immoral people, you can't even live in the world. Like, we're talking about in the church here. I'm writing you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or swindler. Not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. What is this about? Like this is a passage we don't pay a lot of attention to. But we need to. Church excommunication, for what reasons? For the purity of the church. This is the, this is the big issue here. You think, well, we're not going to grow and reach a lot of people if we do this. God is more interested in the sanctity of his people than he is the success of your church. He is serious about purity among his people. And church members are accountable to this. Follow this. Paul is not writing here to the guy who's guilty of continuing sexual immorality. He's talking to the church. And he's addressing their toleration of sin. And he's saying, you're accountable before God for this. And you're accountable for each other. This is baffling. It's startling. The church is actually responsible for the sin of its members. We are responsible for one another. This is what it means to be in the body of Christ together. We are responsible and accountable to God for each other so that if you run off in sin and I don't stop you, I'm accountable to God for that. Church members, accountable. And church members members must be humble. What's the sin of the church here at Corinth? It's pride. He says you're proud, you're boasting. What was their pride? Their pride was toleration of unrepentant sinners in the church. They were open-minded. They were boasting about it. We just welcome anybody can be a member of this church. And he said, that's pride. It's pride for you to claim you're a church of freedom and grace and you're tolerating unrepentant sin in your midst. The alternative is humility. And humility is exclusion of unrepentant sinners from the church. Don't associate with him. And Paul's not just having a bad day in 1 Corinthians 5. This happens at other points in his other letters. Now, here's the deal. We think, we think the opposite way. We think it's pride to say to somebody, you can't come back. We think it'd be more humble to keep them in, right? This is where we, we are so warped in our thinking. Because the reality is, pride is tolerating sin among one another like it's no big deal. That's pride. Humility is addressing sin in your brother or sister's life and even expelling them from the church if necessary. Church membership is essential here. This is why we talked about it earlier. But it was obviously a big deal here. The church, first of all, the church defines who is a member. An individual doesn't define whether or not he's a member of a church. 1 Corinthians 5, the church defines this. And for him to be... Left out of the church. If church membership was just optional, well then, okay, big deal. So he's no longer in the church at Corinth. But it was a big deal. Isolation from the church reflects separation from Christ. To be removed from the body of Christ in 1 Corinthians 5 is the equivalent. It's what Jesus was talking about. You're basically not identified as a brother or sister anymore. You're a pagan or a tax collector as a non-believer. Now this whole phrase, hand this man over to Satan, like that's... So the Spirit may be saved on the day of the Lord. There's tons we could talk about there. But the the picture is, yes, we do this for the purity of the church and for the salvation of the individual. 
We do this for their good. So they will, be, they will see the effect of their flesh and their sin. And they will, by the grace of God, may they turn from it. That's the goal. And you say, well, what, was Satan going to do that? Well, we do see. In 2 Corinthians 12, is a picture there. And 1 Timothy 1, of how God uses even the work of Satan to draw people to trust in him. So we do this for the purity of the church, for the salvation of the individual, and ultimately for the glory of God. This is, this is huge. This is, this is where this whole thing really crystallized for me as a pastor. Because not long after I came here, the elders and I were contacted by a woman in our community. Her husband had committed adultery in their marriage with another woman. And he had left this woman, was committing adultery with this other woman. And he and this other woman had joined our church together. And she calls me and she said, what's the deal? Like, you let my husband who is cheating on you, you, you've affirmed him as a member in your church. He's cheating on me. He's living with this other woman right now. And I thought, wow. It was piercing. Like, this is important. This is important for a lot of reasons. Purity of the church, the good of that man. But this is important for the glory of God in the church. He shows the holiness of his great name in his people, Ezekiel 36 says. So what do we do? Church discipline in action. We obey with the love of Christ. We obey. We do this. The goal is spiritual restoration. That's what we want to do. We want to bring a wandering brother back. So that's what we're after. How do we do that? We be humble. Yes, we're all sinners. We're all in need of grace. So be humble in the process. <clears throat> be biblical. Be biblical. Make sure that you're not just frustrated with somebody or you think you got a pet peeve that they don't do this or that. Like, are they? Ask these questions. Is there sin that is dishonoring God? Is there sin that is damaging the gospel? Paul talks about this in First and Second Timothy. Is there sin that is hurting the unity of the church? That's bringing about division and hurting the church? That it needs to be addressed. Is there sin that's hurting the unity of the church? And then is there sin that is hurting the witness of the church? the glory of God and the community around. Be humble, be biblical. Third, be pure. Be pure. This is, this is the beauty of Matthew 7, 5, Matthew 7, 1 through 5. Church discipline causes us to examine our own lives. You see a brother in sin and you say, am I struggling with the same thing? Take the plank out of my own eye, then help him out. Yes, God's designed this whole thing not just for them to be restored, but for us to grow in purity. Examine your life, examine your motives. Be pure, and be prayerful, pray, pray, pray. Only God can bring about this restoration. Be quiet, meaning talk only to who you need to talk to, not everybody else in the church. Be quick. I don't mean that rush the process, but, but don't prolong this. Obey and be gentle. Be gentle. That's the whole picture in Galatians 6. Restore him gently and be careful. And be intentional. Follow those steps that we just talked about. So obey with the love of Christ. Trust in the authority of Christ. This is what Jesus is talking about in Matthew chapter 18. It's what he says. When he says, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. What he's talking about is when you say to a, re a repentant brother, he's turned back to Christ. Yes, you're, you're forgiven. It's not that your words are forgiving him. You're pronouncing what Jesus has said is entrusted to the church. Pray according to the promise of Christ. Again, I say to you, if two, or you or two of you agree on anything on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That is a, a totally abused verse. Like, that doesn't mean find another Christian who wants to pray for the same thing as you do and you'll get it. It's not what that's saying. This is the context of church discipline. Two or three come together and agree on this or seeking the Lord in this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless this, which even gets to the most abused verse. Expect the presence of Christ. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. Ah, how many times has it said, well, we got more than, we got two or three people or more, so Jesus is here. Well, yeah, but when you were in your prayer closet this morning, he was there too, even though you were alone. So, okay, yes, two or three people. He's, he's still here. But the point is, Jesus is saying in this tough situation in the church, when you're confronting a brother of sin, know this, my presence will be right there with you. It will be right there with you. 
and honor the cross of Christ. This is what, this is what Paul was talking about in 1 Corinthians 5 when he talked about Passover. Christ is paid for sin. We want a Christ who pardons, but do we want a Christ who purifies? When we tolerate sin in the church, when we treat sin like it's no big deal or like it's not our problem, we trample on the sacrifice of Christ. He's died to free us from sin. Let's live like it. The death of Christ on the cross transforms our lives in the church.